living. You about to stop living. I want you to remember me. But the day don't have no memory. I'm coming. Nobody can stop me. Nobody can hold me. Nobody can control me. I'm coming. I'm here to do my thing. I'm here to bring the pain. I'm never ever gonna change. I'm coming. Nobody can stop me. Nobody can hold me. Nobody can control me. I'm coming. I'm here to do my thing. I'm here to bring the pain. I'm never ever gonna change. Like the Tropicana, I got the juice. All for the least, they let the dog loose. Don't make me call up the crew. Now they getting scared, wanna call up a truce. I'm the one like Neil, cocky like Steel. Nobody can go over like I'm. All right, welcome to the premiere edition, or, or I'm sorry, the first edition of the new year, the Jeff Mayweather Show. My name is Alex Eiserman, and of course, as always, I'm joined by Jeff Mayweather himself. Uh, Jeff, happy new year, and how you doing tonight, buddy? Um, so far, so good. I'm still here. <laughs> Well, it's it's it's, it's great, to, great to make it through the first year. Hopefully the second year will get even better and better as we go along. We had a lot of great guests last year, and, and, and of course, tonight we're we're looking forward to a, a couple of great guests as well. We're going to be joined here in a few minutes. Uh, we're actually going to do a, a MMA and boxing night for the first time ever here. Um, we're going to be joined in a few minutes by winner of the Ultimate Fighter 16, uh, member of Team Nelson, along with you, Jeff. Uh, Colton Smith will be joining us. And then in the bottom half of the hour, we're going to be joined by, by the original Magic Man, uh, Molly Starling, will be joining us. Looking forward to seeing that. Uh, Jeff, any, any particular thoughts on these two? Um, well, I mean, of course, I know Marlon um, personally. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I think his nephew was actually married to my niece, so he's kind of distant family in a sense. Um, and plus, he, he asked me for uh, uh, Big Floyd twice also. So, um, yeah, Marlon's a very interesting guy, and i um, looking forward to talking to him and very proud of Colton, um, you know, I think people think it was an upset, uh, but I didn't really think it was an upset. I just think that person was more focused than anyone that was on the show, and, and it showed all the way to the end. All right. Well, you know, we'll, we'll get to them in a few minutes. They'll be joining us, and we'll, we'll share all those memories with them. Um, before that, let's talk a little bit about what's going on right now. Uh, biggest news, I guess, with you know, with your nephew. Everyone always wants to talk about Floyd. Looks like he's uh, just in the face, Robert Guerrero. Anything uh, you heard about that? And, and and what are your thoughts on that matchup? Uh, well, I mean, basically, it's funny. I just talked to Floyd about about maybe ten minutes ago, and actually, he didn't say who he was fighting. <laughs> he kind of kept it a mystery. So um, everybody's saying it's Guerrero, but nobody's really nobody's really sure who it is. And I mean, Floyd didn't reveal it to me that it was Guerrero either. So at this point, I don't even know. So it's just um, well, it's I guess you have to wait and see. Yeah. Well, with Canelo, well, I guess you know, I guess going to meet uh, Trout. I, mean, I I really don't see you know who else could it be unless you know there's somebody totally off the radar that we're not talking about. Um, you know, uh, Martinez is occupied, so they're hoping that that's not happening. Uh, you know, no no uh, no Canelo. So you know, I just don't see how it could be anyone else. Do you think now there's going to be a lot of people that are going to not like that fight too much. Uh, let's let's just say it is that um, Guerrero that he'll be facing. Yeah. Legitimate matchup, or, or or what do you think about that fight? Well, I think I think um, basically Guerrero. I mean, I think prior to this fight, I mean, really hadn't beat anyone to you know to feel as, to the public as though he should um you know uh, merit the fight, but. You know, now, I guess he, you know, I mean, with the, with the big win on Roberto, I mean, now he seems more legitimate. And, you know, you have people that, you know, you have people that, that have their fans, and his fans believe in him, you know. So um, that in itself makes the fight, you know, more marketable than it was. Right. You know, and then the people that want to give him a hard time, I guess, the, the, really the only thing, is that, you know, outside of Canelo and Martinez, is there anybody that pretty much most fans would be content with? You know, I mean, 
I, I, those are the two fights that, that people now that, you know, Pacquiao is a pitcher, I don't think anybody's buying anybody else, you know. I mean, you know, Marquez, you know, oh, well, he had a great victory over uh, Pacquiao, but, you know, we've already been done there, and that, that was a horrible fight. Uh, it was great for Floyd, but it just, you know, the fight itself wasn't good. So there's really nobody, you know, for those that want to bitch about it, there really are no other options anyway. Uh, that pretty much true. I mean, for the for the boxing public, those really are the two options, and it's just a matter of separating the two because Floyd has put two dates out there, so no one just knows who's going to be the first one. Right now, do you think that should every what, theoretically again because we don't know, but you know, if Canelo gets through his fight with Trout and and uh, Floyd does indeed fight. Guerrero, do you believe, you know, the second fight, does it kind of have to be uh, Canelo and Floyd? I think that that would be the fight anyway. I mean, um, it's the only fight that really makes sense. It, it makes more sense than, than Floyd and Guerrero, that's for sure. Um, it's the fight that's going to make, you know, both guys a ton of money. And, you know, it's not only about money, but, I mean, he's the, less, he's the best option left out there for him. You know, and I do think that that since I, I think it makes sense for Canelo to you know to try Trout first because you know there's a lot been you know even though he's undefeated as well been a lot of uh, questions about his resume. So before you get in there and, and go to the ultimate prize, which is Floyd, better to test yourself against uh, somebody else. You know, kind of take a, a little step up before you try to get in the real deep waters, right? Well, I mean that's true, but I I mean I'm not convinced that the fight with Canelo and Trout's going to happen. I'm not convinced of that. And until I see the signed contracts, I don't think that, that fight's going to happen. Dude, why is that? I think it's too big of a risk for um, Canelo to take with the kind of money that's going to be on the table for him with, with Floyd. So I can't see him taking that kind of risk. I mean, he was quick to speak up right after the Jose Lopez and... and um, Ortiz fight, he was quick to speak up and said, oh, I'll fight Lopez. But there's been a big stall about fighting Trout. And because of that, I don't think that, you know, to me, business-wise, you know, if I was his manager, if I was his promoter, I would avoid Trout. There's no money in fighting Trout. Trout is dangerous, you know. But, I mean, if you want to prove that, you know, he's the best, I mean, he will fight Trout, but you know, I mean, he's young. Because the one thing is this, is that if he fights Floyd and he loses, it's not a big deal. There's no shame there, you know. And, okay, if you if you go out and you lose to Trout, you just lost the biggest payday possible ever in your life because Floyd's not going to be around a long time. So you basically, you've killed your biggest payday possible. And, you know, and now you no longer have a title. I mean, you're still viable because you're young. And you can always come back, but now you're back to a long journey, a long back, a long journey to be, you know, a commodity again. So I mean, I just don't see Oscar as a promoter allowing that to happen. Yeah, yeah. It seems like uh, it seems like Trout's in a little bit of a difficult situation. You know, here he is. You know, get gets his breakthrough performance. You know, in a great year for him, finally gets his name on the yeah. on the map there, but. But he's still just not quite known enough, you know, quite a known enough commodity for for guys to really still want to take a a, a test again, take a challenge with, because, you know, even though he's a legitimate fighter, he's he doesn't have that name recognition to bring the dollars to the table, and then so yeah, it does seem like he's going to be be one of those guys that, that has difficulty getting fights, you know, at least in for the next couple of go rounds. If if indeed he doesn't get Canelo, now if he gets Canelo, if that fight is made, obviously, uh, you know, he wins that, then then he's right up there where he needs to be. Right. I mean, it, it, it'll be interesting to see if that fight comes off, but I don't think so. Are you there? Hello? Uh, Jeff. Hey. Yeah, Jeff, sorry about that. Uh, actually, we're going to bring something out. We have a, a question for you from the 718. Uh, welcome to the show. What can we do for you? Uh, hi, my name is Sal from New York City. Uh, 
I really, uh, this is a great show. I really appreciate your family, Jeff. Pardon me, call you Jeff. You know, uh, great boxing family. Thank you. Uh, and you too, I mean, really. And I just saw, looked you up. Gee, you're a Yankee Doodle Dandy, born on the 4th of July. Look at that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm July like 12, 1962. I got you by two years. But we're both cancer. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> but no, you know, the, the boxing star of your family, I mean, I mean, how would you, I mean, what, how do you look at this? I want to ask you a question, because to me, um, uh, yeah. Manny Pacquiao having the, the fight with Marquez again, to me, legitimately, I thought he should have fought Timothy Bradley again. That That, I think, would have resolved some issues. And I don't know what the, any insights you think, considering that they said it was controversial, but I thought it was a lot of hoopla. When I cut the sound down on that fight and I looked at it without any commentary, it was pretty close. I had it a draw, and I actually did have Timothy Bradley. I mean, so to me, I don't know if this really vindicates Timothy Bradley in terms of the loss, but I thought I, thought I saw uh, Manny Pacquiao slipping in that fight. And I, I think because of... That projection and our assumption, you know, gee, you know how it is. You know, if you favor a fighter, you know, listen, if they throw a jab and it misses, people cheer. You know what I mean? So I, to me, I thought that was a very close fight. It could have gone either way. I mean, what do you think about uh, should have should have Manny Pacquiao fought Timothy Bradley again uh, after that instead of Marquez? And what does this tell you about the loss to Marquez? Well, I, mean, I, I think, first of all, me personally, I thought that Manning won the fight, and I thought he won the fight clearly. And to be honest, if you listen to the telecast when it's live, not the, not the replay, you'll also hear Timothy Bradley tell Bob Aaron himself that he thought he lost. But, you know, with that being said, I mean, a lot of people have said the same thing that you've said, but, you know, still most of the people have said, you know, exactly what I said, you know, and, and basically... You know, even Tim Bradley himself, I mean, you're in the fight. When the fight's over with, you don't say, oh, well, I have to go home and watch the fight and because everybody's booing. You know what happened. You was there. You're in the fight. So, I mean, if you, if you really thought in your heart that you won, you just act as though you won. The, the, crowd, the crowd, whatever the crowd say doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. You know, but, I mean, he acted as though he was a guy that, was very unsure if he, you know, if he really won that fight. And, you know, and that's, that was his attitude. And, and since that time, I mean, he's like, he's like winning to hiding it, it seems. It seems like even winning, you know, winning that fight, no matter how he won it, that, you know, he should still be, you know, out there, you know, um, you know, you know, trying to pitch himself, trying to promote himself you know, for the next fight. But it's just like he look at, he went into hiding and it was like almost like, okay, well, everybody think I lost. So I don't even want to deal with the press. I don't want to deal with the media. I don't want to do anything. And, you know, and that's sad. I mean, because, he, you know, whether he won the fight or lost the fight, I mean, on his record, he won the fight. And that's what counts. And he should be, you know, he should be out there, you know, pushing, tooting his horn. And, and, and if he wanted to fight again, that's what he should have done. He should have been out there tooting his horn about, a rematch, you know, saying to the public that um, if everybody think Manny beat me, well, let's do it again, and let's and let's let's get the you know let's make it you know, let's make it clear who won or who lost, but he chose not to. Mm-hmm. Uh, so who do you think uh, your nephew uh, uh, Floyd Mayweather Jr. Uh, who do you see him fighting again? I mean, you know, who's he fighting next? I forget who's he's fighting. Schedule to fight next. I mean, there's a possibility of him fighting. Uh, Robert Guerrero, you know. Okay, the um, ghost. That's right. Yeah, I, the ghost. Yeah, the ghost. I mean, I, I, I just like I said, I talked to Floyd about ten minutes ago, and he never really, he never let me know exactly who he would fight. He just said, "Yeah, I'm fighting on May 4th. and that's wow. what he said. He never said who it was. <laughs> See, yeah, you probably asked this question. You got to forgive me. It's, I'm really intrigued by this. What's it like? I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, you and your two other I, brothers. To me, I, I always thought Roger Mayweather was a brilliant technician. You know, hey, I, I Colton, this is Alex. I'll bring you right on the show, okay? Hello? Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I always thought that Roger Mayweather was a brilliant technician. I used to love, obviously, I, I thought, it, you know, his chin wasn't that solid. But to me, I mean, I, I can see how Floyd says a, a great deal. He gives Roger a lot of credit 
for you know training him to be the boxer that he is today. Do, do you have any thoughts about that? Like who in your family was the most influential in uh, Floyd Mayweather Jr. becoming the fighter he is today? Well, I mean, of course, it's his dad. I mean, his dad built the foundation. I mean, the things that you guys are seeing now, Floyd was able to do at six years old. But mm -hmm. the reality of it is this, is that his dad is also 13 years removed from his, his professional career. So obviously, Roger has done a great job as well. So I think that they both have contributed, you know, immensely to his career. All right, hey, Jeff, let's Oh, oh, we're going to go ahead and Sorry about that little technical difficulties there. We're going to move to the next segment of our show. We're going to welcome on. And thanks for the 718. Thanks for that uh, call there. Appreciate that. I'm uh, going to move on, talk a little MMA here. Welcome on the show, the winner of the Ultimate Fighter 16, uh, Colton Smith. Colton, welcome to the Jeff Mayweather Show. Hey, how you guys doing? Hey, hey how's it going, Colton? Doing very well, Coach. Yeah, All right, man. well, Colton, thanks for taking a, a a few minutes to join us there. Uh, you know, con obviously, first of all, congratulations on your your victory there. Is it all sunk in yet? Uh, how's life back there in Texas now that you're the Ultimate Fighter champion? Oh, uh, you know, it's good. Uh, I'm training hard. Uh, we have a couple guys have fights coming up. Uh, Andrew Craig is fighting in Brazil on the UFC card on the 17th, I believe, uh, maybe the 19th, and uh, Tim Kennedy's fighting on the 12th. Um, in Oklahoma, the last Strike Force card. So I've been really busy. They helped me a lot for my finale fight, so I'm helping them for their fights. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of interested, uh, you know, I, as a former military guy, and I was a little more hardcore because I was in the Air Force, you know, so we were a little more stringent <laughs> than you were there in, in the Army, of course. Hey, what, what are you guys laughing at? <laughs> All right. Well, well anyway, the, the one thing that was kind of interesting to me, because I, I, I'm quite a bit older than you, and, and actually when I was in the military, active duty, it was right around the beginning of the, uh, I'm sorry, the UFC, you know, back in 1, 2, and 3, and all that kind of stuff in the early 90s. Um, just kind of curious, though, as far as, as getting to compete, being in the Army, how does that work? Are they all, I mean, you know, things like, uh, you know, getting injured when it's not military duty. How, how does it work with the Army as far as they're, uh, you know, standing behind you and allowing you to compete in mixed martial arts? So the, the basically, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a non-commissioned officer, I'm a leader um, in the Army, obviously, and, uh, you know, the Army Combatives Program is a very a very big program right now. It's blowing up uh, in the military and the Army. Um, you know, it not only teaches you hand-to-hand -hand, uh, hand -hand, uh, combat, but it also teaches you, uh, you know, discipline and having the, the courage under fire and uh, just overall having the ability to, to, to act under pressure um, with every aspect of your life. And I think that... Um, you know, they see this as an opportunity to, to push on the combatives program and show soldiers you can be an, an active duty leader as well as a you know professional athlete at the same time. All right. Now, as far as you're completing your your actual obligations go, I know you took some special time off. You know, you said you didn't take leave for a couple of years to get to compete in the Ultimate Fighter. How is that going to be coming up in the future? I mean, do you you still just going to train in your time off, or well, obviously it's part of your job and that kind of thing. But are, are they making some special? Uh, you know, considerations for you as far as training and that kind of thing goes, or are you just going to kind of be part-time until your, your military duties are up? You know, I have about 18 months left on my, my current contract with the military. Um, right now, you know, they uh, they do allow me uh, some time to train, um, but the thing is, you know, I do a lot of the training on my own uh, off-duty, so mission comes first, uh, and then fighting comes second, obviously, so, um, you know, I still train full-time. I train just as much as any other pro fighter does now, so... You know, I, I, I just have to juggle two, you know, two jobs pretty much, and uh, I have a family, kids, and uh, so my wife is left with a lot of the, uh, the responsibilities of the family. Well, you know, Jeff, this is what's kind of interesting to me, and, and you can get some insight on this, because obviously being in the military and, and being a father had to make it pretty interesting going into the Ultimate Fighter house and then competing with all those guys, a bunch of, you know, mostly uh, young single guys in, in a house and, and Jeff, first of all, let's get to you. How was it with Colton, you know, as far as, you know, what's the discipline and dedication? Did he take it a little more seriously than the other guys? Or, or what do you think of him actually, you know, the training aspect of what he was doing? Well, with Colton, Colton was kind of like, he seemed like he had a quiet confidence about himself. He never really bragged. He never never boasted or anything like that. But, I mean, he always, he always worked hard and always, 
that, you know, want to go the extra mile. And, um, but there was always, I could always tell there was a confidence there, you know, with inside of him, you know, and it's just that he wasn't, a, you know, a guy that, that was vocal, like, um, what's his name with the pink hair? I hate that. Julian. Julian. <laughs> Which I didn't know all this stuff that was going on in the house until I actually got a chance to watch the show myself. But, no, I mean, one thing about Colton was that, like I said, he was a guy that he came to work and he stayed focused. You know, he didn't he didn't get caught up in, you know, trying to, you know, be something that he wasn't. I mean, he kept his military attitude. He was quiet. He was calm. And he was to himself. And, and he just worked hard. Yeah. And, Colton, you know, for you, how was it being in, in that house? You know, obviously it looked so much different. Was it distracting to you or, or was it, you know, a, a huge advantage for you because you were able to keep your – your focus and your wits about you, whereas some of the other guys, you know, kind of were maybe more um, worried about, uh, you, you know, performing for the camera and that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, coming into the show, uh, I realized that on paper I was probably the least experienced guy in the house, um, but I knew my life experiences and my experience in the military that I'd have the advantage, and, uh, you know, it ended up paying dividends. Uh, I fought some really tough guys right off the bat, some some true veterans of the sport, been in pros for 10, 12 years, you know, and, uh ended up knocking a couple of those guys off. And I saw guys break mentally in the house, you know. It wasn't so much they were breaking because they weren't, you know, up to snuff with their technique and with their abilities. They were breaking mentally, you know, at the house, being away from their families, being away from their element, being away from their team. Uh, luckily, I, I've I've endured that before. So, you know, I knew uh, the further I went in the tournament, the, the more success I'd have. Do you think it's more difficult for a guy that's married and, and, and has kids or, or one or the other than, than maybe a single guy? You know, on, on the one hand, maybe you have more life experience, but then on the other hand, you know, you, you have a lot of distractions, or not distractions, but, you know, things you're worried about outside of outside of the house that, you know, you really can't focus on and pay attention to, like your wife and family. Uh, you know, it, it kind of goes both ways. Uh, I see uh, a guy with life and family a little more mature. Um, I see them, you know, their wife and their family uh, realizing that this is a dream for them, so... You know, they're to come from a structured life, so I think that they could be focused, but a lot of the single guys, they do whatever the hell they want to do. You know, they, they wake up and they feel like waking up, train, they want to, want to train. Well, in the house, it's not really like that, you know. So, um, you know, I think I think both, I don't think there's really an easier an easier out. Like if you're, I mean, if you're a single guy, you don't have any friends or family, I get it. You know, like James Cheney admitted that, you know, the situation he was in, he didn't really have a whole lot of friends or family back home, so he, he enjoyed being in the house, so... You know, it's, it's a double-edged sword. All right. And, and overall, you know, looking back at the show, obviously a lot of things are edited for, you know, to be more interesting and, and for TV purposes. But, but overall, would you say that, that they uh, kind of portray the, the, the housing part, or I guess the show overall, accurately, or do you think it's kind of, a, you know, pretty far from, from reality? Uh, it's, not, it's not too far from reality, but they, they did. They definitely uh, amplified some situations that weren't nearly as bad as what they showed, and uh, they also stretched out like uh, Julian's outburst. They stretched out his outburst through the whole season, when in reality it was only happened for a couple days. You know, he had a a couple rough days after his fight. He was drunk those two days, you know, and had a lot of outbursts during those two days. But they stretched it out over six week periods. So, you know, with Julian, you know, he's a colorful character. So, it, you know, he brought it upon himself, but. You know, he definitely uh, was portrayed a lot worse than he really was. Now, now, Jeff, so tell us a little, Jeff. You said you didn't know anything about going on in the house. None of this stuff. You didn't hear about any any of these guys talking about when they came in or or bringing their drama to you. Um, no, there was only one time when Julian and um, what's the guy's name, Colton? The kid that was from Cameron? Alaska. Oh, 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 no, not oh, Cameron. Uh, oh, oh, Alaska. Yeah, uh, Nick Webb. Nick Webb. Yeah, him and Nick. I mean, I guess they had uh, an argument at the house, and they brought it into, you know, they brought it into training, and they went full go um, at one another. And so that was, you know, that was kind of, that kind of let me know there was something going on at the house that, you know, I didn't know nothing about. Like I said, I didn't know anything. And came to the house, I didn't know nothing. I didn't know that this is where people become stars or they become you know, the bad boy or, or whatever the case may be because this was my first time being on the show. This was actually my first time ever even watching the program. So to me, it was kind of like it was a breakout thing for, for Julian to be the character 
you know. But don't get me wrong. I mean, at the same time, I mean, I kind of, you know, take some of the blame from him because he does have Tourette's. And, and I think that, you know, showed up as well. But um, I know that him and Nick, they went at it one day. They went they went at it hard as though they were actually in a real fight. And that, right. you know, that has stemmed from, you know, from something that happened at the house. Uh, last question on, on that kind of thing, um, Colton, before I get into the actual training kind of thing. Um, you know, as, as far as stuff like that, do you think some of the guys like, like Julian or the other guys maybe being more focused on big personalities kind of hurt them, whereas, you know, someone like you, you're, you're more focused on winning? And did that give you an advantage there that, you know, as far as not trying to, to, to be somebody necessarily that you weren't and just, just, you know, focusing on the task at hand? Yeah, you know, I think that happens in, in fights, not even in the, in the Ultimate Fighter, but as well as uh, UFC fights outside. A lot of people are sorted about their persona, what they're wearing, you know, how they're looking, you know, uh, what people think about them. They're on the forums and all that stuff. I think you need to worry about winning the fight. You know, that's the most important thing to me is uh, getting in there, performing up to my potential and winning the fight. And, yeah, there, there's a couple guys in the house that are too worried about, you know, what they look like, you know, uh, you know, I'll, I'll rag on I'll rag on Mike Mike Hill a little bit. He's my buddy, but you know, always had his shirt off, always flexing. You know, I mean, always always you know m mugging everybody. You know, but I mean, that's that's what they do. That's not me. It's, that'll never be me. So you know, some guys have to puff their chest out to feel good. You know, I don't have to do that. So. All right. All right. So so you get drafted on on Roy's team going in. Did you have a preference of of which coach that that. Uh, which coach you ended up with, and, and, and how did Roy's style uh, work with you? Before the Ultimate Fighter, um, me and my, my, my coach is back home, and, and Tim Kennedy and everybody, we talked about it, and we found out who the coaches were going to be. I wanted to be on Roy's team because he's from Vegas. I knew he could bring in some really good guys from Vegas, like, like you know, Jeff and, and uh, the coaches he did bring in, you know, so I was definitely pleased with uh, getting chosen for Roy's team. Now, now, Roy catches a lot of, lot of slack, and, and they they kind of portrayed it on that show as as being that you know he didn't really pay attention. You guys are bringing you any anybody in. You know they didn't show all the coach that he brought in. But you know Jeff has said many times, you know bringing in people like Hoyce Gracie, the Diaz brothers, and that kind of thing. Do you think that the show kind of and again going back to the same question, but but um, focusing on Roy, did they kind of? portray him incorrectly as far as, you know, being kind of uh, non-caring about you guys and not really giving you guys the training you deserve? Yes, without a doubt. Uh, the producers don't like Roy. They didn't like Roy. They didn't like Roy when he was on the season. Um, it was very evident. We, we were the red-headed red stepchildren of the production. I mean, we got treated definitely different than Team Carwin did uh, from the from the staff, from from the higher-ups and stuff. I'll be, I'll be honest about it. And, uh, Roy did, Roy did a good job. You know, Roy, um, Roy has won the show. I knew that in the back of my head the whole time that he knows, he knows the formula to win this show. And, uh, you know, I, I believed in him. A lot of the guys on my team didn't, but they were losing, so they started blaming the coach or blaming everybody else but themselves. Well, I wasn't going to blame Roy. You know, Roy brought in some killers. Roy brought in Rashad Evans, Forrest Griffin, Amir Sadal, and Martin Kim, and Mike Pyle. Um, he brought in some really good guys. I mean, he brought in all the scrap pack, you know, I mean, Hoist Gracie, he brought in, you know, really good guys. So I can't complain about the coaching. You know, having Jeff Mayweather there is unbelievable. Um, having Anthony Anthony there, uh, you know, we had, we had some good guys there, good coaches there to help us out. So, I mean, if we reached out and looked for the help, the coaches were there. If we didn't reach out for it, you know, we, we had big boy rules on our team. You know, I will say that. You know, there was structure on Team Carlin, what they said you do. Uh, you know, team Team Big Country is more – he knew we were pro fighters. He wasn't going to reinvent the wheel with us. He was going to let us, you know, pick our own path. If we want to sit or practice and sit down on the side, that's fine. That's our prerogative. But if we want to learn something, grab Roy, grab Jeff, uh, have have Coach Mayweather hold some mitts for you. You know, I mean, that's a, first, that's a once in a lifetime opportunity. So, you know, I mean, a lot of us took advantage of it. By half of us took advantage of it, half of us didn't. So. Yeah, I know that you. Uh... Uh, Roy had tweeted before when they when the showed Forrest Griffin on. He said, "Man, you think that was the first coach I ever brought on there? Because you know they weren't showing, you know, when they showed Carr when the guys he was bringing in, but they weren't showing any of the guys that Roy brought in. So obviously he was quite aware of of them kind of not really uh, treating him fairly as well." Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, uh, he brought in awesome guys. You know, having Rashad Evans in there. You know, Rashad Evans is a guy that I didn't I didn't really uh, care for too much before I went on the show, and when I met him. You know, unbelievable. And same with Nick and Nate Diaz. They were 
amazing. They, they just their uh, their coaching prowess to help us. You know, they were very genuine guys. I was really surprised. You know, you, you see them portrayed as you know the bad boys, but they were there to coach us and did a very good job doing it. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about our man Jeff Mayweather here. First of all, did you know anything about Jeff? I mean, obviously you're an MMA guy. Um, did any you or any other guys were you familiar with Jeff going into the show? Um, I mean, not. I mean, obviously Mayweather, you know, and uh, obviously we know we know, we know uh, that part of it. But I mean, no, not not like his, his whole background and everything. But I mean, you know, Roy, Roy brought him in. Obviously, as a permanent coach, so that was good enough for us. Yeah, and, and what did you think of his style? I mean, did, did the guys really seem to, to warm up to him and embrace him? I know he's got a couple of guys that are talking quite a bit on Twitter and seem, uh, seem to be fans of his, but what, overall, what was the impression of, of Jeff and most of the guys? Yeah, I mean, uh, no one ever complained. There's no, I mean, you can't complain. He was there. He showed up. Uh, he's always there a helping hand to hold, hold mitts for us, uh, smacked me in the head every time I'd, I didn't bring my hand back to my, to my face. Uh, man. Oh, was that uh, a doom session there? Doom, man. <laughs> yeah. he, he, he throws a doom down on me, man. And that happened to me a lot, you know. Uh, that's some, that was part of my game that I was uh, really raw in, you know. I'm striking, but now I'm I'm picking it up finally. But uh, it was great, you know, having to hold mitts for us and uh, just giving us uh, good, good tips on our striking, man, especially our hands. You know, hands are really underrated. MMA, everybody wants to do the one-punch knockout. But, I mean, throwing combinations together, Jeff really helped us uh, bring the the true boxing aspect in the MMA, and uh, you know he's he's the kind of guy that he, he's evolving with the MMA sport as well. He's realizing you know he was showing me some stuff. Get off on an angle. Here's your takedown. You know, I mean, he was showing you know he's definitely not he's not closed minded when it comes to the uh, you know the wrestling and everything else too. Well then, Jeff, I guess we get to we get to add Colton's name to the the list of MMA doom victims you have, right? We have King Mo and Roy and. <laughs> Vitor Belfort, and we can add Colton on there, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> doom. <laughs> now, now, Jeff, were, were you warned about these doom sessions? And you know, you, you possibly could have knocked someone off the show with a you know life debilitating injury there. <laughs> oh no. well, I mean, basically, these guys are fighting in what four ounce gloves. So I mean, believe me, they can take a, a hit upside the head with a pad with a mitt. And before before the show, the only thing I knew about MMA was step on his foot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, and I noticed, told you know, congratulations on your victory, but you didn't follow Jeff's MMA advice. You know, he always tells everybody step on their feet, and I don't believe I I remember any uh, foot stomps on there from you. <laughs> no, no, I, no, no foot stomps, no foot stomps. <laughs> No, but that was, I mean, that was, that was a great victory. I mean, I really, really liked the way Colton handled that, that, that whole scenario because the other guy was more like he was flash and, and glamour and this and that, and, and it was almost like Colton's an old country boy, and I'm going to show you how it's really done. It locked him up, and that was it. No more. No, I mean, all the fancy stuff, all the other trash talking, all the drink and champagne, all of it didn't help at all, you know, and I mean, and GA, GSP in his corner and all the other stuff didn't help either. So, I mean, it was, it was a great big, not just, you know, not just, and also for me, you know, for also for Roy because of the fact that he caught so much hell on the show and to see Colton, you know, you know, kind of like, it kind of like, you know, made things balance off to me. It was kind of like, wait a second, oh, okay, well, this guy isn't doing anything. He's not teaching him nothing. He's not doing anything. You know, not not to say that, you know, of course, Roy didn't have a, a whole lot to do with that. I mean, of course, Colton had, Colton had a whole lot to do with it himself because, I mean, he knew his strengths, and, and that's what he stuck with it during the fight. You know, and it was, I mean, for me, it was, you know, it was just, it was, it was gratifying, and, and, you know, it was, I mean, it was a great victory, I mean, because it, it felt like it was a victory for not just for him, but for, you know, everybody that was a part of the team. Okay. Yeah, um, let me ask you about that, uh, Colton, real quick, you know, going back to Roy. Um, you know, what were the basic, you know, you, you heard a lot of people criticizing his coaching ability, and I'm sure the producers kind of, you know, were feeding into that to make for good TV, because they, they, the whole thing was to make Roy look like, you know, he wasn't doing his job. But overall on the team, you know, was – were they really receptive? Did they like him a lot as a coach, or was it you know really a lot of guys that that weren't happy with him at all? 
you know, uh, like I said before, I said in other interviews, you know, everyone everyone loved being on Big Country's team, but as soon as the guys started losing, they wanted to blame everybody but themselves, you know, and that happens a lot, you know, outside of the show as well. And uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't like that, and uh, I stay away from that. Every time I, I heard the negativity of anybody talking about Roy or even the Team Carlin guys talking about Carlin or anything like that, I got away from it. You know, I, I had to stay positive in that house and, uh, you know, try to get through my own way. So, you know, of course you heard it, but at the end of the day, man, Roy is a uh, top heavyweight in the world. He's an ultimate fighter champion. The guy is uh, a veteran of the sport, um, and I learned a lot from him. You know, that experience is not negative in one bit for me. And, you know, win or lose, draw, whatever happened in the, uh, the, uh, the finale, I still would have had the same outlook, you know. Nothing, nothing would have changed. But now you've had all this positive talk about you since the win here, so I want to get some dirt on Jeff, um, from Jeff. Now, obviously, you know, wrestling is your thing. So, Jeff, what was Colton like when the, the first time you got a hold of him is boxing? You know, what did you think? You know, work with some of the best boxers in the world, champions. Uh, you know, what was it like the first time you got a hold of Colton with, uh, with his boxing? <laughs> well, I mean, one thing with, with Colton was one thing that he did have and was funny is that he had, he had very good movement on his feet. You know, he knew how to move on his feet real well. Um, of course, I mean, the problem was with, with most most MMA guys probably is, you know, bringing their hands back, you know, and that Colton had that problem, but not, not for a very long time. I mean, he caught on real quick, you know, and um, but he wasn't one of those guys who was, you know, upset with, with you know, the striking or, or, or working with me because he had all the, he worked with everybody, he, you know, he got it, he balanced out on everything. You know, but he did work with me from time to time, and, and when we worked, we had good work. And, I mean, and like he said, I mean, I was, you know, starting to understand the concept of not just punching, but also that, you know, while you're punching, sometimes you're going to kick and you're going to you're going to strike, you're going to, you know, you're going to dive in there and things like that. And, and I kind of tried to teach him, you know, work with him in that, in that way. I mean, as best as I could because, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not really an MMA mindset, but I do, I do know that if you, you know, if you're, you can't really come down the middle with almost anyone because you're going to get a knee in the face. So that much I knew. So at least I was trying to teach him if you're going to, you know, go off the punch, you got to go either on one leg on one side or on the other side as opposed to, you know, trying to dive down the middle and then get that knee in your face. <laughs> Right. Now, hey Jeff, as you go along here, do you, do you approach teaching anybody um, different? Like, let's say you're working with someone like Holden, you know, who's who's you know obviously much more of a wrestler than a striker. Do you, do you approach working with them any different than you would with someone who's you know purely a striker or mostly a striker? Well, no. I mean, one, the one thing that now I've learned to focus more on is is getting the fighters' punch count up and getting the fighters throwing count you know, combinations and tightening up their defense. And I think that, you know, with Roy, it's, it's helped him, you know, immensely. You know, I mean, because, I mean, Roy's punch count is up well over 500 punches around, and I mean, he's over 250 pounds, you know. And um, and I think the highest punch count we, we got was like uh, 618. So, I mean, and, you know, and so basically that's that's the most important thing for me. And so I don't want to take nothing away from the MMA part, but I just want to do my part that I know that I can do as far as, you know, tightening up their defense and actually getting their punch count up. Because, I mean, you know, in a fight, that's, that's very important. All right. And then, and then one last question for you, Jeff, as far as uh, all this goes. When, when you first saw your, your group, your team, uh, well, Roy's team, how did you see think Colton stacked up? Did, did he, was he someone that right off that you said, you know, this guy is going to be a, a contender for the title? Or, or, you know, honestly, where did you, when you first saw him, what did you think of him and his chances? No, I think, I think probably all of us, you know, at first we all looked at uh, Dom. I mean, the big guy, kind of like John Jones, comes out there, bangs this guy out in the, in the, you know, to get in the house. But, the one thing is that I think he lost focus. I think he got caught up in the fact that he could punch so hard and that, you know, that was just going to be his ticket to, you know, to to winning the show. And then I started to see certain guys start to separate themselves from one another and then start just to, to find their own niche. 
you know, and Coulter, like I said, Coulter was a guy that always worked hard, but he was very quiet. It wasn't like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. You know, you had Julian, of course, that's always, you know, 100%. It's about show. It's like almost the cameras are always on me, you know, and I think Dom got caught up in that as well. And, you know, it's, I mean, you know, I mean, the guy, um, what's his name? Uh, Cameron was a guy who I think he was he was more he was more too too much focused on being a coach than actually you know preparing himself for what he needed to do you know so I mean there were so many different personalities in there that you know I can't really I can't really say who you know basically you know but as the show put it this way as the show started to progress. I could see, you know, Colton rising because Colton actually wanted to fight with his eye completely busted, <laughs> and I couldn't believe it <laughs> because the guy, looked, the guy never hit him in the face. I didn't understand that. I was like, like this fight, this fight is staged because <laughs> the guy never punched him in the face, and, he, and his eye was already busted. I couldn't believe it. But you know, but like I said, I mean, basically, you know, he stayed focused. And I think in the end of the day, that that's what really, you know, the cream rose to the top because he didn't get caught up in those stupid arguments, all the other stuff that was going on. He wasn't trying to, you know, take his shirt off and look like the, you know, I'm the, I'm the pretty boy of the show or anything like that. I mean, he just stayed focused. And that's what it seemed like happened. It just seemed like the guy who stayed the most focused and didn't get so caught up in the TV part of it actually prevailed. All right, just got a couple more questions for you, Colton, here, and then we're going to bring on Marlon Starling to be joining us. Uh, just first of all, just, just touch on that a little bit, Colton, uh, you know, y your response to that. Um, did, when you went into the house, did you feel, you know, from the beginning that, that you were one of the guys that, that had the best shots of winning and, you know, even going in the final, you were an underdog against Richie. Uh, you know, was there ever any time that, that, that you thought, you know, maybe you were in over your head? I mean, I was, I was the underdog the whole show. I'm talking from the, from the first first fight all the way through. Every guy that I fought, you know, on paper, they uh, had a lot more experience, a lot more fights than I had. Um, but, you know, that in my mind, you know, I wouldn't even try off the show if I didn't think I could win it. You know, I wasn't going to go there to be on TV and with her to, to be the, the ultimate fighter champion. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, t I mean, everybody else's eyes, um, other than guys on my team that I've rolled with, they, you know, they realize, you know, I'm, I'm legit. I knew what I was doing. But, uh, you know, I was, I was the underdog. I like that, though, because, I mean, you, you can let it all out there. When, when you're the underdog, you have nothing to lose. Go out there and just perform the best you can and, uh, you know, get your hand ready at the end of the day. Um, so but that's just basically what I did, you know. I mean, all, every guy I fought had a lot more years of fighting than I had and a lot more fights. So I had, to, I had to show, you know, I was there to belong. All right. And then, uh, you know, as far as your thoughts on other guys in the house, you know, who who are some of the guys that, that may, were maybe a little underrated to you and then, you know, probably should be in the, in the UFC in the future? Man, you know, you'd be really surprised, but uh, Nick Webb, Nick Heron Webb, you know, a lot of guys probably don't know this, but that that, that kid, 22 years old, um, you know, already has 16 pro fights, but all around, he was he was decent all around. He he wasn't really lacking in the area, um, except for focus. Um, but other than that, you know, technically wise, he'd give anyone fits on the feet, on the ground, in the wrestling department, anywhere in practice. Uh, in the fight, he kind of choked a little bit against Igor. Um, but uh, Nick Heron loves a guy. I mean, you know, the whole the whole team, every one of the cast was good. I mean, there were, you know, people said it's a boring season, but but what I when they say it's a boring season, I say we we had we had sixteen very very tough guys who just kind of nullify each other's skill sets, and it might have appeared boring when you watch the fights, but you know, it's it's high level guys in there. You know, you had guys like Sam Alvey. Uh, he's beaten a lot of good guys. Guys like Bristol Morundi. You know, they both beaten very good guys, and they both got knocked off pretty quick in the tournament. I mean. You know, uh -huh. they're facing tough competition. So, so you, you know all these guys, 16 guys, you're living with, or 15 guys, and you. Um, anyone that you're you're really tight with after the show, you, you know, you're remaining uh, buddies with? Well, you know, I talk to everyone. I talk to, you know, I talk to, not everyone. I talk to Igor, uh, Julian, and I talk every now and then. I talk to, um, uh, I talk to about everybody from my team. Uh, uh, Mike Hill, every now and then, he calls me up. Uh, we see how he's see how he's doing and stuff. And uh, Joey Rivera, Sam Alvey, me and him talk. Uh, that's about it, though, you know. And and um, 
every now and then I'll see some Twitter feed, Twitter action, you know, from the rest of the guys, and we'll we'll, we'll jump on it and talk crap about about Nick Webb. Or, no, I'm just kidding, but <laughs> but we'll, we'll get on there and uh, and I uh, get, get a rise out of people, you know, and and rag on somebody, make fun of C Core. I don't know. <laughs> So, so what are you doing as far as uh, you know? Finally, let's wrap up with this. You know, as far as your striking, uh, who are you working with uh, to, to improve that? Now that you don't have Jeff anymore to, to be whooping you around with your Doom session. Man, you know, I've, I've been very blessed. I have a guy named Jason Schaefer in my corner. Uh, he did my game plan for for Richie, and obviously it wasn't uh, the flashiest game plan. The biggest thing was uh, having the orthodox advantage against the southpaw, getting my foot on the outside uh, when he comes in, when he commits. You know. Send a two three two down the pipe, you know, and, and get off on the angle. Looks to take down. Uh, luckily, I didn't even have to do that. You know, he came in, committed on me. I took him down every time. Um, but you know, I've been working a lot of striking. I'm excited to be able to showcase my striking uh, when the fight's right. Uh, when I, you know, when the game plan permits that. Cause I'm big on the game plan and making sure I, I stick to it. Um, so yeah, Jason Schaefer, he's a uh, crew Muay Thai. Uh, you know, and then Tim Kennedy, Andrew Craig, the both phenomenal strikers, helped me a lot. Uh, you know, we, we have a whole just a whole stable of fighters here in Central Texas that have just really helped me a lot. You know, Iron Sharpens Iron, I help, my, help the best I can with wrestling with those guys. They help me with striking, you know, and then I, I work my jiu-jitsu also, obviously. So I'm really excited about the future, man. You know, I think uh, I think my skill set's uh, sharpening every day. Every day I'm in the gym, I'm, I'm getting better and better. You know, I'm, I'm never, ever going to be good enough in wrestling, jiu-jitsu, striking, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm a student in the game. I'm never going to stop. Now, now you mentioned Tim Kennedy there. You know, obviously when your your uh, military commitments up, uh, are you planning on staying there? Are you gonna maybe head over to Jackson's, or are you gonna relocate to Vegas, or you know, do you, have you thought about that yet? Uh, you know, ultimately, if if you pursue fighting as a full time deal, uh, what the future holds for you and where you're going? I, I don't, I don't yet. Right now, this is where I'm gonna stay. Um, you know, Central Texas has been great. You know, I have a great thing going on with all this, all the different gyms that I travel around uh, during the week and, and train with, and. Uh, Really tough guys, you know, and I haven't. Obviously, I'm I'm getting I'm not always the hammer. I'm the nail as well, you know. A lot of times in practice, so while you're still the nail, you're still learning. So you know, I'm 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 fine where I'm at. Oh, and and I forgot to ask you this one. Want me to ask this of you? Um, so we'll wrap up with this. Just as far as uh, your counterpart in the Australian version, there, Robert Whitaker. Uh, anything you know about him? And and you know, would you like to fight him at some point? I guess it's probably a you know something the UFC would would look at at some point. Robert would I you know I don't know anything about him. Uh, it was kind of funny because the one the 155 winner, uh, Norman Park. I thought he was the winner of of the 170, and he started talking crap to me on Twitter and telling me that I should give you know or Dana White didn't give him a Harley, so he wants to fight me to get my Harley, and I didn't know who he was, and I was like, I'll fight you. I don't even know, I don't even know who you are, like. You know, I'm not here to talk crap, but if we can fight. You know, I don't know why you're you're here calling me out, but. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know either one of them. I haven't looked, watched any of their fights. Uh, I guess I'll. You know, I probably should look at them and see. You know, I mean, either way, if uh, Joe Silva calls me and tells me, you know, fight this dude, I'm gonna fight him. So. Right. All right. Well, uh, yeah. And Jeff, just this last thought from Colton. We'll let him get out here. I know it's a little later there, so we're gonna bring on Marlon Sterling here in just a moment. Uh, just, just last thoughts on uh, on Colton and what it was like working with him. Um, I mean, like I said, it was it was a pleasure working in with, with Colton. Actually, it was a pleasure working with everybody on the show. Like I said, I didn't find out about all this other, you know, downplaying what was, you know, part of the show, and everybody, you know, passing the blame. You know, I didn't I didn't know any any anything about that until after this show aired. But I mean, to be honest, I had no problem working with no one that was a part of the show. I actually enjoyed working with all the guys and. And I thought that, you know, all the guys all the guys were I mean, you made a great team, I thought so. And I think that even the guys even after they lost, I mean, they were willing to help one another and things like that. So I mean I thought that I thought that, you know, everything was fine. I, I enjoyed the show. I mean And and Colton for you just, just tell the folks, well first if you got any, any trash on Jeff, we'd love to hear before you go or your final thoughts on him and then also just tell us where the folks can find on Twitter. Facebook and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, uh, Jeff, Jeff, man, that, that that guy can eat some eat some some food, man. Snacks. He always had snacks, man. They were chipping away from the camera. They were, they were brand name snacks, like you know, Lay's potato <laughs> chips. Like, yeah, he had to put 
He had to hide them all the time, man, and I was like cutting weight, and I was looking at him, you know, some gummy worms, was crazy as food. He'd be, he'd, uh, I'm talking, in, in between rounds, in between rounds, we'd be hitting mitts, I'm cutting weight, and he stops, throws his mitts off, and goes eat some Lay's potato chips and drinks his, his Coke or whatever, you know, I'm like, well, is this guy serious? Like, this guy's, you know, I mean, so, and he was notorious for it. He was notorious, man. I'm talking all day. All, you could practice for 12 hours. He'd be eating the whole 12 hours. He didn't stop. So. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, well, he wasn't cut weight. It wasn't his problem, right, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> I had to make weight. <laughs> But, uh, but that, I'm sure he had, he was texting while he was doing that too. If he had his cell phone there. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, but fo- follow me on uh, on Twitter at Colton Smith MMA. Um, I have a, a fan page. Uh, Facebook's private, but I got a Facebook fan page. Uh, want to give a shout out to Tap Out Faction Mouth Guards Advocare, uh, my manager uh, Tina Vidal ML Management, all my training partners. You know Tim Kennedy, Andrew Craig, all my coaches, everybody in uh. My family and my beautiful wife and kids. All right, Cole. Well, we appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining us. And again, congratulations on your your uh, victory there. And we look forward to your to your next appearance in in uh, the UFC. And uh, Jeff, we'll let you wrap it up since uh, it's your custom. <laughs> well, coaches, thanks for being on the show. And like I said, I'm very proud of you, man. But you know, it's time to go. Bye. <laughs> See you guys later. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, take care. Colton. Take care. All right, that was uh, Colton Smith, Ultimate Fighter, 16 winner. Thanks so much for him for joining us. Uh, uh, we're gonna move right into our next guest. Uh, he's on the line here. Sorry, a few minutes late there, but we're gonna welcome boxing great to the show, Marlon Starling. Marlon, welcome to the show. How you doing tonight, sir? Okay, how you guys doing? Good man. Doing great. Glad you can make it. Hey, my pleasure, man. We we tried to have Martin, uh, Marlon on the end of last year, and, and unfortunately we had some, some communication problems and, and a little bit of confusion going on, so he wasn't able to make that show. But, but you know, hey, what better way to, to welcome in the new year than having Marlon Starling join us uh, on January 1st. So so thanks for joining us, Marlon. Hey, my, my pleasure, man. You, you guys are fired. <laughs> no, Jeff is fired. Jeff, Jeff doesn't communicate very well sometimes. <laughs> no. Hey, hey Jeff, how you doing, Jeff? Old school. You know, he sends me the text message, and you can't send me a text message. You got to call. I know. You got to you, you, you tie me up with that text message. I, I'm, not, I'm not used to my old fashioned dude. <laughs> well, we have to mail you a letter, I guess, right? How is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, that? Come on, now, you <laughs> <laughs> well, we could at least maybe we could have went to his MySpace page and messaged him there. That'd have been what we could have done. <laughs> well, 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 first of all, I want to say Happy New Year to you guys. Well, Thank you so too. Um, well, Marlon, just, let's just catch the, catch the folks up. You know what, what's going on with you? What are you up to these days? I, I know you've been really busy since since you retired uh, a while ago. I, You've d- done different things, so so you know, kind of catch the folks up with what you're doing right now. Well, right now, believe it or not, I'm out of work, but I'm still I'm working with fighters in the gym. I I, I enjoy um, I enjoy the sport of boxing. You know, I you know my my, my old lady always tell me I'm a, I'm a but um, you know the, the, the boxing is what I love to do, and and I love to, I'm a, I'm a great trainer. I love training these guys that think they know it all, but don't find out that don't know nothing. Well, you know, you know, before we get into that, Jeff, I, I want to back up here a second. What are you doing in inviting Marlon Starling on the show after he had a, he beat up your brother two times? What's up with that? Ah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, 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 guys. No, I fought, I fought a tough, I fought a tough Floyd Mayweather, and he talked trash. <laughs> and, and, and you, you know, uh, fighting the fight, fight Mayweather, you're always going to get a battle. You, you're going to get a battle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So, 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 tell us about the guys now, Marlon. I mean, just you know, oh, tell us a little bit about the folks. You know, the, the guys that you're training now, the new breed. How do they compare to the to the guys that you know back when you were when you were doing your thing? No comparison. 
no comparison whatsoever. You know, I hate to say it, but um, I guess it's in the water. It's in the milk. It's in the, it's, it's in the milk. So these guys, they, they don't have what we had back in the uh, early 80s. You know, as far as, uh, uh, so, so you think the, the talent level is a lot less? I think I think the talent level is not as good as it was. We, are, You know, I, I hear a lot of people talking about um, the guy that beat um, Chad Dawson. What was his name? Um, Andre Ward. Andre Ward. Yeah. You know, they say how exceptional he looked. You know, Andre Ward is a, is a good fighter, no question about it. So he'll be a, he'll be a C-level fighter in, in our era. What do you think about that, Jeff? I mean, I think that um, probably the competition level is probably probably less. But also, I think that me, myself, personally, I never like to judge fighters from different eras because there's no way you could ever put these two guys in the ring at the same time, at the same age. So you I, know, never Jeff, really, I never really touched that. Jeff, Jeff, um, I feel the same way about that. I feel yeah. the same way about that. We uh, we always want to compare errors. We can't compare errors. Right. It's, 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 it's impossible. Exactly. What do you guys What do you guys think as far as a commitment? To me, it seems like you know I'm a little bit. Well, I'm a whole lot younger than you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm I'm a little bit younger than you guys. But when we were all growing up, we didn't have distractions. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have Twitter. We didn't have texting. We didn't have. Well, we had the video games, but we did. It just didn't seem to consume us. We had to go outside. Do you think the distractions have really Played a played a part in these guys not you know really you know, focusing and, and and truly top top fighters coming about. I, I think it had a good I think it has a good good impact on on uh, young kids being lazy. Yeah. And and do you guys I mean do you think the the work ethic I mean do you think the talent might be there but but you know when you're, you're working with guys you both of you guys train fighters. Um, do, do you see that, the distractions and maybe the dedication of the heart not being there that, you know, maybe guys back in the era had? Yes, I, I think it's, it's a lot of distractions today. Not only it's a lot mm -hmm. of distractions, it's a lot of money. And, and people people are, uh, are driven by money. I think we was, we was driven by being the best. Yeah. Well, you know, in, in kind of hearing you say that, you know, and, and you're the one guy that uh, I think you can certainly look at and say money wasn't a thing for you because... You know, just kind of go over the fact you retired really, really young, 32 years old, still one of the best welterweights in the world. Um, why did you decide 31. to retire that? 31. <laughs> Sorry, 31. 31. Um, why did you retire so young, still, you know, still at the, the top of your game? Why did you retire so young? And also, how were you able to not ever come back? I mean, so many guys have, have retired and, and come back and retired and come back. So, so go over that a little bit with us. Well, the reason why... For one thing, the reason why I, I mean, I didn't look at the age. I looked at how the body felt. And it, not, not only is how the body, body felt, too many of my friends were champions. So, so you didn't want to have to fight them? Well, you know, um, I, I got to a point where, you know, what, what more do you want? You want to be the best. You want to be the best. When Marlon Sterling retired, he was the best welterweight in the world. Yeah. Hey, and uh, Jeff, you know, he's always kind of claimed that the reason you retired is because you were ducking him. Is there any truth to that? Well, I think me and Jeff uh, boxed a few times in the gym. You know, he, he, was, a, he was a man, wasn't he? <laughs> if, 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 anything, if anything those Mayweathers have, they have that 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 will to win, and I know when I fought Floyd twice, I had to, I had to, I didn't beat him up. I beat him off me. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you say to that, Jeff? I I never seen the fight. I just know about the fights. I know I know the press conferences I've seen and things like that, and you know, and I know there was a lot of trash talking. So, but that's all I know. Oh, I mean, oh. I never really, I never actually seen the fight. Well, with me, yeah. with me, and, you, with me and your brother. Yeah. Well, when I fought, when I fought, yeah. when I fought your your brother, Jeff, he talked so much crap. 
I mean, he that's fought what I know. <laughs> I, 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 like, like I said, I didn't beat him up. I beat him off me. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, one thing I had seen in an interview, you were discussing Floyd Jr. and, and you know, in, in his level or, you know, where he's at now and how he'd have compared, you know, in your day had he fought. Um, you know, what do you think of him as a, as a fighter? And, and do you think, I guess you had said you don't think he'd be undefeated if he'd fought back in your time, but, but how do you think he'd have stacked up against, against the better fighters back then? Well, I think, I think with, 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 with um, Floyd Jr., Floyd Jr. is he's, he's, he's not what you call um, real fast, but, you know, he's very sharp. I think with, with Floyd Jr., I think you have to give him a lot of feints, and you have to keep him in the middle of the ring. He's a good fighter, no question about it. But, you know, in, in, in my era, he's beatable. No question about it, he's a good fighter. But in my era, he's beatable. Don't forget, now, we won 15. Uh, what, what do you have to say about that, Jeff? How do you think he'd have done? How would he have done against Marlon Starling? <laughs> no way of telling. Like I said, I mean, I don't compare fighters from different eras. So, I mean, <laughs> of course, I mean... Me, myself, I feel Floyd would have been a great fighter in any era. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. Well, you, you know, the only thing to me it seems like yeah. now as compared to back then, you know, in that era, it's like then even if you were the best fighter, it would be harder, I, I would think, to be undefeated because, you know, now it's kind of like Floyd and then there's everybody else. But you go back then, it seemed like there were so many great fighters at every division that even if you were the best, you know, the chances are you're going to get knocked out by somebody at some point because with so many great fighters on on any given night, someone's going to have just maybe a little bit more than you. And and not only that, you know, the, the way, you know, they have catch weight. We didn't know anything about a catch weight. There's no such thing as a catch weight. I mean, it, it, it's a all what, what is a catch weight? <laughs> That's when they, they want to put two two guys together and... and <laughs> And make now, it easier you, on them, you know, I guess. That, that you know, that, that's called money weight. <laughs> right. That's, but, not um, that's money weight. But Marley, you got Marley. You know, you know who created the catch weight? Who's that? She was Leonard. She was the inventor. Listen, he was the inventor of the catch weight. Exactly, huh? but but don't forget now. Don't forget now. Ray Leonard. And, and and say um, Benitez or, or hers, you know, when they started going up, there wasn't a such thing as a, a 154. It was 40, it was 35, 47, 60. We didn't have that in between. Well, you have to Not only you that, the at, at, at light heavyweight. We had we had fifteen. Don't forget we had fifteen miles too. Oh, one true. thing about when I, the one thing about it when I fought, you know you had you were gonna be in there for the long run, right? And it, I did. So he is being conditioned. And one thing about Floyd Mayweather Jr. To me, he's a very well conditioned athlete. So so do you think that actually you know. If the sport was still at, at, at 15 rounds a day, that would actually uh, play. I mean, now he's undefeated, so obviously it wouldn't be – it's not too hard now, but it would even be more to his advantage if it was 15 rounds still? Um, no, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, like, 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 like Jeff said, you know, we can't we, – we always compare errors. You know, I, I look up on Facebook and I see uh, Joe Lewis fighting uh, Muhammad Ali. Those things will never happen. I hate when people talk about it. Let's be happy with what we have today. I hear you on that. I, I definitely agree with that. Hey, let's talk a little bit about, about your career. But before I have one question for you. I heard you, you know, and I know you're famous for talking in the third person. Uh, were you the first one to do that? Because I, you know, it's kind of a relatively new thing. So, so did you usher that in? You know, sometimes, you know, maybe one of the reasons why I, I do it is because when Marlon Stalin was um, was fighting, it was, it was a point in his career, he was the manager. So, you know, in, 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 in this sport, I never, Marlon Stalin never won that title alone. 
Believe me, I had to have my I had to have my people with me. So sometimes yeah. when I when I spoke, when I when I did interviews or when I went to uh negotiate contracts, sometimes I had to talk about that third person. Because these money hungry uh promoters, you know, they think they talk they think every boxer is dumb. Yeah, that's 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 one thing that's that's sad, you know, is that uh, you know the, the way they try to take advantage of a lot of these guys and, and a lot of the boxers that let them, you know, and and guys that can stand up and take care of themselves and and make sure that they're getting uh getting getting right into the deal. You, you know, your hats off to them, and you know it's better for them. There's too many stories of, of guys that had great careers and ended up being broke and and you know couldn't take care of themselves because they were screwed in some way by the manager. So you know it's it's definitely good to to hear about the boxers that were able to to handle their own business. That, that that's one of the reasons why Marlon Sterling could never get over the top because he was too he was too uh, self independent. He wasn't gonna let a, a promoter or a manager control his his well being. And sometimes I, I, I lost also some big fights because of that. But you know when I got out I did it my way. I'm happy with my, my career. Right. Right. I want to talk about that and career. That's, that's true. Go ahead, Jeff. Beg your pardon? No, no. What I was really saying is basically, it kind of reminded me a little bit of of Bernard Hopkins. Bernard Hopkins was that way for the longest. He went against the grain for so long, so long, so long, until finally he got to fight with um with um De La Hoya, and then he was able. Then he had. To, then he finally played the game. He played the game the right way. Then he started seeing you know more money than he ever seen in his life. You know, and it's kind of like it's kind of like being a rap star until your 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 song crosses over. And once your song crosses over, you never want to go back to being a rap star anymore. You wanna you wanna you wanna now be a pop star with with rap connotation. Jeff, Jeff, that's one uh-huh. of the reasons why. That's one of the reasons I got out of boxing. I was fed up with, I was already fought for, for 30 years in the ring. I was fed up with the Don Kings and the Bob Ams and the Cedric Cushions. They were, they were, just, they were just, you know, they were meat movers, and, and they were just trying to rob me everywhere they could. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you had said you got you had no regrets and you got out at the right time, but as a part of you, you know, kind of, Kind of wish that that you know you didn't mean, you, you got out and you got a regular job like the rest of us. You you, you worked in restaurants. You did the limo thing. Um, you know, there's a part you kind of regret that you you weren't able to get in there and capitalize on the bank of bucks that you know you know these these multi million dollar fights that that could have set you up for life. You know what? I, I, I wish it. I wish it every day. I, I wake up. I wish I would have. But you know what? If, if your heart is not in it, why get in there and let somebody be you? Well, let's talk a little bit like about your career. First of all, I'd like to know, you know, you worked with Freddie Roach. How, he's kind of an interesting guy. You know, me and Jeff talked about him a lot. Um, you know, a, a couple of years ago, he was the greatest trainer ever. Now he's total dirt. You know, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that realistic. I'm just saying, you know, the way that people talk, you know, when you're on the, when your fighter's on the top, you know, when Manny's doing his thing, he was the best ever. Now that he's had a, a, a poor run here, you know, people are really trashing on him. What were your thoughts of Freddie as a, as a trainer and, and what he did with you? Well, 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 Freddie Roach, Freddie Roach and Eddie Fush, when they got Marlon Stalin, they got a ready-made champion. They they didn't have to teach Marlon Stalin anything. Marlon Stalin was Marlon Stalin's trainer. Freddie Roach yeah. was was my commissioner, and he was one that that looked over things. But you know, when it comes down to the training, Marlon Stalin was really Marlon Stalin's trainer, and and those guys would those guys would tell you themselves. You know, Eddie. Eddie Fudge, God rest his soul, um, he knew that Marlon Stalin, because I heard an interview where he said, I got an I got a, a, a old-fashioned, ready-made fighter. And, and, and same thing with Freddie Roach. He knew when he didn't have to do nothing but make sure that I, I was doing the right thing. Right. Now, Jeff, we talk about that quite a bit as far as trainers, you know, and, and, and guys like Freddie Roach are other ones that kind of get guys right at the top of the game and that kind of... Uh, you know, people maybe give them uh, more credit than deserve just because they happen to have a hot fighter at the time. So as a trainer, I guess it's kind of strange asking you this, but, you know, how much 
how important is really a trainer? I mean, you know, if you have someone like a, you know, Marlon Sterling in his prime, a, you know, Manny Pacquiao when Freddie got him, you know, how, how much of a part do you guys really play in their success and do you deserve? Well, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, the thing is this, is that the most important thing when you got a fighter that's already established, you got to find out the one thing. There's always, there's always, you know, things that a fighter can learn or he can do better. Exactly. And that's and those are the things that you got to look at, and you got to find those those are the perks that you got to find to work on. You like if a guy lacks in defense, you got to help him with his defense. If a guy lacks in, you know, if a guy lacks in offense, you got to help him in that. But I mean, the thing is, this is that. You know, when you get a fighter that's already made, that's already been champion, of course, I mean, your job is not that hard. You mess it up if you try to do too much. So basically what you need to do is just keep that fighter focused and, you know, keep it with, with the skills that he has. Don't tamper with it. Because once you start messing with something that's already a proven commodity, I mean, Correct. you're not you're doing a disservice to that fighter. So, I mean, Jeff, you know, Jeff, my thing is... Jeff. Jeff, you know, because you've been around some of my uh, training camps when I was in Vegas back in the day. You right. know that the, the, the boss, the, bo the real boss in that, in that, in that training thing was Marlon Sound. I mean, Freddie oh, Roach yeah. and, 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 yeah. and, and Eddie Fudge, you know, they did a great job with me. But you know what? They didn't have to do that but pick out little things that, that, that you know, sometimes you you slack or you could you know you know I had a fight. I had a sometimes fight on HBO. You gotta remind it. Exactly. Sometimes. You know, I it. mean I had a fight on I, I had a fight on I had a fight on HBO. It was my last fight under contract with my promoters, the last fight under contract with my managers. And I got hit after the bell. The only the, you know, the only thing the only thing I can say happened in that fight was I got two comfortables. No, that, that's the Marlon Dollar fight, right? That's the Marlon Dollar fight. Yeah, that fight is, that's a famous fight. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, and, and, you know <laughs> I, I never got my title back. Hey, yeah, let me, Marlon, I'm, 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 let me, I'm, let me. But let's talk about it one second. I just want to finish up one thing on the training team, then I do want to talk about that fight and, and a couple other ones. But real quick, Jeff, we, we had mentioned, um, I don't want to throw any trainers under the bus or, or any people, but we've talked to length about one person. But but finishing up on the trainer thing, is that the biggest mistake you think trainers make when they when they get with a new fighter is not adapting their socks? Like I said, I know the one person in particular you think has really not progressed because the 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 trainer was trying to change his style. So do you think that's a huge mistake I mean, when you get someone like a Celestino Caballero or or someone that's you know already a, a great fighter trying to change him to suit you? Is that a huge problem? I mean, I think it. I think it is when, as a me as a trainer, I look for what a fighter, what I feel that that fighter needs. I mean, with Celestino, Celestino was already the proven champion when I had him. But the one thing with Celestino is Celestino, six foot tall, fighting 126 pounds. He don't need to be fighting. He needs to be boxing, and that's the one thing that I changed with him. I mean, he already knew how to move. He knew how to not get hit. He knew how to dance around and, and all those things, but. He still would never use his jab. He always wanted to be in, you know, in harm's way by wanting to, you know, be combative. You, you, and you can't, you, you can't make a, you can't make a, a, a boxer try, try, try to be a fighter. I mean, you can't make a boxer to try to be a fighter. You can't do that. What, what, but see, what I did was, I, if, if, if you want to fight, I'm going to box you. And if you want to box, I'm going to fight you. I did it all. Go ahead. Well, let, let's get to that, that uh, infamous uh, Tomas Molinaris fight. Um, you know, originally it was it was you you were uh, you lost the fight. They overturned it, became a no contest, but he still got to keep the belt. Uh, you, you know, all these years later, any you know, do you, do you regret how it was handled? to piss you off, or or you know, what are your thoughts yeah, on that fight? I want I want my belt. I, I want my WBC welterweight championship belt. So, so how does that? I mean, well, Jeff, let me ask you: How should they normally handle? You know, if, if something overturned later on, should they have? Uh, you know, did they make the right decision, letting him keep the belt, or should they give him the belt back, or how is that normally handled, or should it have been handled? I mean, I should have got the belt I mean, back, but you know what? What? Well, I should have got the belt back, but you know what? Today, 
it's, it's not the belt that brings the money. It's the title that brings the money. Right. Well, you you know, you actually, uh, well, let's talk about a couple of these other fights. Um, you know, really, uh, you, you had two fights with Breland. Just see your thoughts on those, uh, you know, great fights. You're, you won one. You had a draw there. Uh, thoughts on Breland as a fighter. It seemed like, you know, he was, you know, when he was an amateur, he was the greatest ever. And, you know, he had a really nice uh, pro career, but just didn't quite seem to live up to what people thought his capabilities were. Well, one of the reasons, you know, they, they, brung, they brung him up a little bit too fast because he shouldn't have fought Marlon Stalin at that time. He wasn't strong enough for Marlon Stalin. He, you know, when I fought him the first time, I fought him from the heart, and I, and I, and I dogged him, right? But the, the second fight, I fought him from the, from the head like he's supposed to, and I had no problems. I mean, the, the, that fight, that, that first fight was brilliant was the worst fight I ever fought in my career. And I won the title. And Jeff, Jeff, what were your thoughts on, on Breland? I, I believe, didn't you at one time say that you thought he was the greatest amateur ever? Or, or you know, what were your thoughts on him and as far as his pro career? And did you see the, the fight he had with Sterling? Yeah, I, I, I tell, tell you what, I tell you one thing. I mean, he... I'll tell you one thing about Mark Breland. I boxed from Tommy Hearns to, I boxed a lot of good professionals out there. Um, Mark Breland jab hurt like most guys' right hand. Really? And people always say, Jeff, oh, Breland going to be a, uh, people said Breland's going to be an uh, uh, easy fight. Breland was one hell of a fighter. But, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't, um, we really couldn't see it because, you know what, he wasn't, he wasn't um, seasoned enough to fight Marlon Solomon at, at that time. Yeah. And, and, Jeff, what were your thoughts on Breland? I mean, I thought Breland was a, I mean, anyway, he was a great amateur, but. And that's it. I think that, I think that the amateur style didn't transcend over to the professional style. And don't get me wrong, I mean, if he wasn't touted as highly as he was as an amateur, what he what he achieved wouldn't be a big deal because, I mean, he still became two-time world champion, which is great, in, you know, for anyone. To be one-time world champion is great. But because of, right. you know, his status as an amateur was, you know, was so prominent and, you know, and it was so big that, I mean, expectations of, of Marlon Starling, I mean, of, of Mark Breeden was beyond real. And so because of that in itself, he never lived up to the brilliance of what everybody thought he was going to be. And, you know, it's sad. It wasn't, it wasn't, his, it wasn't really his fault. It was the media's fault. Well, well you know, Jeff, Jeff well, one thing about Marlon Sound, right, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to be the WBC champ or the WBA champ. I wanted to be the best. I wanted to be the best. Right. And I can say, um, February 4th, 1989, people around the world, even my peers, they say, you know what, that model sound is the best worth to wait on the planet. That's when my career was over. Yeah, I was, yeah. was going to talk about that, that victory against Lloyd Hunnigan. You, you pretty much consider that the, the high point of your career then? Well, you know, I, the only reason why I say that is because I beat every I beat everybody from all around the world from 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 London to New York to to Tokyo I beat them and then and when I fought Hunnigan, which Hunnigan was doing all that talking I, I treated him like a like a step like a like a baby I had him eating in my hands. Right. And Jeff, you saw that fight, right? Yeah, yeah, I saw that fight. That was a great fight, you know, and that was one of the fights. Where I became really a huge Marlon Stalin fan, and actually my mindset, you know, when I started training, you know, I don't know. I mean, I never I've seen Marlon train, but I'm talking about just the mentality of that fight, you know, stuck in my head. When I would be running, I would be thinking that this is what Marlon Stalin was doing, you know, to get ready for this fight, you know, mentally myself, you know. And, and you know, so, Jeff, Jeff, when you, Jeff, when you when you come down to it, Jeff. What you're saying here is saying, you're saying 95 percent of this but this conditioning. You got to be ready. Yeah, definitely. Well, well see, that, 
And that's what I told you there, Marlon. I, I told you he said that you retired. You're ducking. See, he had you. He had you on his mind. He was ready to to, to whoop up on you, and then you went and retired on him. I was kind of running in Vegas, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, after that, uh, after the Huntington fight, uh, you know, you'd fought in Hartford a few times, but it had been pretty cool. You, you fought the Korean, the South Korean there guy, uh, uh, Chung. What was that like getting, you know, your your backyard there in Hartford, getting to, to have a, a world title fight there? But you know, you, you guys didn't mention you guys didn't mention the Michael Nunn fight. Well, that was after that fight. No, I was, Michael Nunn fight was in between Huntington and and and. Um, no, sir. Michael Nunn. Then I went back down to fight Huntington. No, you you fought Remember, Chung I, in I, September of '89, and you fought Nunn in April of 1990. Okay, so I, I I had to go I had to I had to go down I had to go down to fight, but then I had to fight um, I had to I had to go down to fight Blocker. Yeah, Blocker was your last fight. Right. Right. So yeah, I was just I was just yeah I was kind of going in order there. You had the Heineken, and then the very next fight after that was was your fight with with uh, Chung in in, in uh, Korea. But we could talk about none. What were your thoughts on that? You know, you had none. None was a. Uh, you know, 34 and 0 at the time. What were your thoughts on him? Well, well, see, with, with, with Michael Nunn, people thought that Michael Nunn was the second coming to God, just like yeah. they thought about Donald Curry. But right. you know, with, with that Michael, with, with Michael Nunn, Michael Nunn didn't win that fight. I lost that fight. Yeah. Now, now. now why did you, you know, a couple of these losses that you had, you know, well, not the loss, but the no contest with Molinares and then with none. Did you ever, you know, consider trying to get a rematch with these guys, or, you know, why did you never get a second crack at them? You know, Marlon Stahl was too in, uh, uh, independent. A lot of the, a lot of the uh, promoters, you know, I wanted what they wanted, and that was more money. And, and, and right. it was tough to get money from the promoters back then. Right. Yeah, it seems like you know, especially in the case of Molinari's, even though you know you the the, the fight was after the uh, after the bell, you know, you clearly had, you know were winning that fight, so I don't think that was uh, maybe something that they needed to see again. Um, but yeah, just just going going back to the fight with Chung, you know. So what was it like? You know, like to the Connecticut guy, you know, he fought through your earlier fights, non championship fights there. But but what was it like to get to be in your basically your hometown there, fighting uh, fighting for a world title? Well, you know, I think you know, I have to even today. I have to thank the the, the people of Greater Harvard because that was the first fight they had. That was the first world championship fight they had, probably in forty years, and and, right. and it was a big, it was, it was a big, um, it was something, it was something big for the, the Greater Harvard pe- people, and then right. I think, um, you know, I, I I would rather I would rather I would rather look good, beat the guy good. And get out clean, rather than go to try to stop somebody and and get caught with a with a with a bad shot. Right. Well, yeah, and then you know the other the other Connecticut guy or you know somebody you worked with there uh, recently was Chad Dawson. You actually had sparred with him, and and, and what are your thoughts on Chad? And and do you think he can uh, come back? Um, I think um, you know, you, when you when you wait, you rust. And um, I think right now maybe maybe Chad's career is over. But you know, tr- Chad had too much ability. Will will he should leave the boxing game alone? Because Chad could could be a a, a good fighter. I mean, it wasn't like uh, this guy uh, beat him bad. I think Chad's heart wasn't in, in that fight as much as uh, he he wanted it. Chad, Chad needed right. be a, a strong trainer. Right. So, so now you 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 spar with him correctly, and, and and if you did, how how did that go? You know, you know I, you, with me, with me, I'm gonna always hold my own. I don't care who I'm fighting with. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, well, you, know, you, I, you know, I I, I got ready. I, I was in Vegas for for um, uh, Tommy Hearns getting ready for Leonard, the first fight. Listen, anywhere I go, I'm going to hold my own. That's just me. <laughs> well, let, let me ask this, 
both this. I'm not comparing you guys in your prime to, to fighters now, but I want to ask you both this. If you put your mind to it and you decided you were coming back and you were going to put all your mind into training, where would Marlon Starling be as a fighter right now? How would you how would you rank with the current guys? Oh, definitely. I, I, you know what? Um, you, you think you think um, you think Pacquiao and Mayweather would be a good fight? That, me, me, me and Floyd will have a good fight. So, okay. so you think you can still hang in there with them? Oh, you, you know what I need? I need uh, uh, John Coffey. You know who John Coffey is? You know who is, Jeff? Jeff, do you no, know who know John Coffey is? I know Jerome Coffey. No, John Coffey. Do you know who John Coffey is? Uh-uh. The guy who played in the Green Mile. <laughs> which, which you know the guy who played in the Green Mile? Now if that guy could come and suck all the all the air back into me, I'll fight him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean if he can clean if he can clean my body out to where to where my body is is is, is uh thirty years old, I'll come back. <laughs> So Jeff, what about you? Where's a uh, where's a uh, 87 year old Jeff Mayweather a stack up if he came back? <laughs> hey Jeff, we're doing the right thing. Yeah, I'll be, we train the fighters. I'll be the, yeah, I'll be a couple guys, but that's about it. <laughs> hey, you know what? Like, give me, give they me a round or two. <laughs> yeah, I'll be the Give me a round or two. A round or two, and I'm done. Uh, well, Jeff, I, I saw you with Irish Brian Reynolds there. We're doing your thing, so you know I, I think you can take him at least, at least right now, right? <laughs> yeah, well, he's fifteen, so I think I can't take him right now. <laughs> Probably take him too, I'm sure. <laughs> hey, hey, Marlon, uh, you, this last question: Was there ever a point that you know, having retired at thirty-one, you know, you, you said you walked away, you had no regrets, but was there ever a point where you you said that you know maybe I'm going to go try to fight again? I, I did, I did, but you know, every time I I, I thought about it, um, I didn't I didn't feel it. I didn't I didn't feel that. Um, I didn't I didn't want to I didn't want to train. I didn't want to I didn't want to do it like that anymore. I mean, it was just when, when I when I when I was boxing, I loved the gym. I didn't, you know, I just didn't want to do it. And when you don't want to do it, I'm not getting in that ring and, and, and making myself look bad. And the only way I'm going to make myself look bad is not being in shape. Right. Well, you know, it's, it's great that you were able to, to see that and know that, you know, you didn't have what it takes. You know, I guess that's the hardest thing is that the fighters or football players, I always hear them saying, you know, they love the game itself, but the preparation is what made them retire because they realized that they just didn't have the, the desire or the, or the want to to get in there and put in all the hard work to get into the ring. So, so you know, Jeff, it's, it's great that he was able to realize that, but is that something that's real common for, for aging fighters or well, not, I don't want to say aging because Marlon wasn't that old when he retired, but but for guys, when can you you kind of well, see it in them and, and kind of you you say that I, I wasn't old. I was remember now at that time at that time I had did I did I, I did most of my life. I started when I was uh, eight years old. Right. Yeah. So I, I, you, know, I you guess you, you know yeah you might have been young for a lot of. You definitely put the miles in. I put the miles in. Yeah. I wasn't in a, a fighter that, that sweat. You never see Marlon in a, in a boxing match where he's gasping for where, gasping for air in the in the tenth round. I was ready to go. Right. Well, Jeff, you know, as a trainer, what's the first thing that you see go normally? Is it the you know the, the skills or is it the desire to, to put in the work that's necessary to to be a champion or, or an elite fighter? Well, I mean. And sometimes it's a combination of both. I mean, but you know, basically, um, I think sometimes when a guy gets to a certain level, sometimes he thinks that he's there, and and he forget how he got there. He forgot that he was hungry. Sometimes that can be the downfall, and you know, and then sometimes you know, like I said, sometimes a guy gets full of himself and they just don't work hard anymore. You exactly. Know? Exactly. So, I mean, You're right, it could, be, it, could be, it could be a combination of both things, you know, that, that can bring a fighter down. And also, 
when you when you become an older fighter, you got to work harder than a younger fighter. You know, because I mean, the things that the shortcomings that that you have as an older fighter, you know, the things that when you were young were able to get away with. I mean, a young fighter, what you're going to be facing is sometimes you'll be facing, like for instance, say Marlon Stalin may be facing Marlon Stalin, but his name may be Robert Charles, but it's the same thing as when he was young. He's facing himself in that ring, and, and sometimes that's your that's your biggest that's your biggest um, opponent when you face someone that is able to do the things that you are able to do. But now he's doing them to you, you know. And yeah, that, you know, you know that, 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 that <laughs> just that is so embarrassing, ain't that? Well, you know, you can you can see it, and you you can see it, you can see it, but can't do it. I mean, there's a lot of times that you know, I go in the gym, I go in the gym, and and I I can see me beating us, beating these guys good. But when I when I'm ready to do something, they don't. <laughs> Well, well, the one thing I think that's really commendable about both of you guys is that, you know, you, you both had good careers, and, and both of you, you know, unlike a lot of these guys that, that hang in there for way too long, you both left, you know, relatively at the top of your game. You know, you both knew because, you know, Jeff Mar uh, Marlon Jeff was kind of said the same thing as you. You know, he knew that, that, you know, his heart just wasn't in anymore. Well, you, I guess there's a little different. You said you felt older, but, you know, Jeff just knew his heart wasn't really in fighting anymore, and he didn't want to – you know, continue with the uh, with the sport, knowing that uh, you know if he couldn't give it at all, that he, you know, he didn't want to go in there and get his <laughs> get knocked around anymore, right, Jeff? And and that's the truth. That was that was my, that was my thing. You know, every time I, I I I go in the gym and I want to do it, you know, after after a while, you said that I come out of the gym and I said I hurt I hurt for two or three days. Right, right. That's true. That's not fun. Mm -hmm. Not at all. <laughs> and, this is, and, and, and this is something I love to do. But when you're hurting, I know, you know what, I can, I, I enjoy boxing. I, enjoy, I love the sport of boxing. Well, yeah, it sounds like you do, Marlon. It was, you know, it's been great having you on tonight. And it's, it's great hearing stories from you, you know, and it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's good to know you're still involved in sport training people and, you know, I definitely think the sport could use some more people like you because you're, you're quite an entertaining character. Um, you know, is there anything else you want to wrap up as far as, you know, telling the folks uh, uh, anything you have to add? And also, you know, tell them where they can keep up with the, uh, I, I know you have a Facebook, where they can uh, snail mail you. <laughs> Don't text you, we know that, but, uh, you know, do, uh, do you do Twitter or anything like that? <laughs> well, listen, listen. I'm a bro, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a trainer looking to, I'm a good trainer looking for some good work. I don't, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a babysitter. I'm not a babysitter. I'm a good trainer that's looking for work. There you go. All right, and then, and then where can they, they catch you on uh, uh, Facebook? I guess it look up uh, Marlon, uh, Marlon Starling and... Oh, uh, well, you, you can reach that? me on my email. My email is magic, I know at yahoo.com or, or either right, on my Facebook then, uh, page. And then, and then you got, I'm sure you, you do Twitter and Instagram, huh? And probably not, right? <laughs> no, I don't do Twitter. I don't do none of that other stuff. <laughs> Jeff, no, I'm just, you know, right question. question. You're, taking his, you're taking his man to the future. <laughs> hey, 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 Jeff, hey, Jeff. Jeff, I'm old-fashioned. Come on, let me be old, okay? <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, and, I know. And last one, I have a question actually for you, Jeff. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think of Marlon? You know, you know, he he, he says all his big game, but he he stole his name from Antonio Tarver. What, what do you think about that? Oh, no, wait, 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 <laughs> wait, you got to, wait, 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> there was only, hey, there was only it? one magic man in boxing, and you, you're talking to him. Hey, <laughs> all right, one thing. All right, one thing to ask about it. I bet you don't remember yeah. this. Okay. I asked you I asked you this about when the fight with Molinari, because one time I remember they used to document it, so they used to show it so much, show it so much when you would say, I was not knocked out. Oh, no, 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 Jeff, I got another one. Do I look back out? <laughs> hey, Jeff, 
Who takes some stuff? The, the, I, the last thing I remember is when the bell rang. When the bell rang, right? The next thing I remember was leaving the hotel room, getting on the plane. Yes. Yes. No. <laughs> and I was this, this is what I'm doing. To the guy. That's what I asked. No. You know what's funny? That's exactly what I was going to bring up because I remember asking you that. I said, "Do you remember what happened?" You said, "No." You said, "I was at home." He said, the only thing I remember is I was at home watching TV and said, "What the hell I'm doing here?" <laughs> you told me that. You told me that a long hey, hey, time Jeff. ago. I was like, "Wow." Jeff, I, I had so, somebody, somebody else that question. I had somebody else that question. You know what, Jeff? That, that is that is. Uh, Five, they told me I spent five hours in the hospital. Jeff, that's five yes. hours in my life that I'll never get back. Yes, yes. And people ask you what that's you right. miss. Don't don't say that because when that bell rang, yes, the next thing I'm the next thing I remember was was leaving my hotel room, getting ready to go home. <laughs> so, so what was that like going back? That the first time you saw that fight and you saw that you were knocked out. What was that? What was that like seeing that? Um. One thing I didn't know, one thing, if you looked at the fight, one thing I didn't know, you don't get in the ring on a stretcher. So I'm not getting off, I'm not getting out of this ring. They tried to take me out on the stretcher. Yeah. I said, I'm walking well, out of here. Kinda, you, know, that, you know, it's easy for me to say as a guy's never, you know, taken hits in the ring there, but, you know, it's kind of strange because, you know, you, it didn't look like a devastating punch necessarily, especially for someone like you that had such a... Uh, you know, reputation for having to grant a chin, you know, never been knocked out or anything like that before. So it was just, uh, you know, just one of those things, I guess, probably in the right spot. But it had it been kind of kind of weird, you know, seeing the interview you had with Larry Burton, you know, and it was kind of strange and getting to go back and see all that, uh, you know, for the first time. It, it, listen, it only takes one good shot to put you out. Yeah. Yep. Turn off the lights. <laughs> Turn off the <laughs> lights. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> All right, Jeff, hey, 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 anything hey, else for, for... Hey, Jeff, they tell you says, turn them off. <laughs> <laughs> turn them off. I mean, listen, if, 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 if that would not ever happen, right, I went through a whole career in a, in a, in a tough era never being off my floor, ne 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 never being off my foot. That's that's wow. and you can good. Say, and you yeah, can say never great. within the uh, actual... Time of a of a round because <laughs> it was after the bell, so never actually during a fight. You know that's right. That's yeah. true. That's official. Well, but, Jeff, but Jeff, any, do me uh, one favor, Jeff. Jeff, ask, ask, ask Floyd, will he uh, sign a contract to fight me? I fight Floyd. I fight him next week if he wants to. Hey, you know that might be as 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 long as I get the long as I get. Hey, that's all I wanted. I did. I just want a uh, one percent of the game. <laughs> hey, Marlon, you know, we, we, before you came on at the beginning of the show, Jeff said he talked to Floyd just before the show, and, and Floyd would reveal who he's fighting. So, you know, it might be you. Maybe, uh, maybe that's going to be the big surprise announcement. Could be. <laughs> Floyd is too shocked for me right now. <laughs> but, hey, but you know, we wait, but we have a good round or two. I tell you that. <laughs> How much time you need? Well, maybe you could be his October, his October fight. You give you a little more time to get ready. Hey, but I'm getting, I'm getting out up to the second or third round. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. well, All right, let the, the original <laughs> and the only Magic Man go here. Uh, uh, anything else you got to add that, that you haven't talk about? Hey, you know, I just want to thank you guys and thank the listeners. Uh, and, you know, I had a great career, and I, I thank you guys for having me on. I appreciate it. Jeff, uh, anything you want to add? Yeah, it's our pleasure, man. I'm glad you were able to make it back this time. And um, like I said, it was a pleasure talking to you. Had a hey, Jeff, I just got to ask you one. Jeff, I just got to ask you one thing, okay? Mm hmm. Do I look knocked out? <laughs> <laughs> I was not knocked out. I was not even knocked out. You want it? You better work on the TV. TV. A lot of <laughs> you were still ready to go another round, I believe, weren't you? Oh, I was ready. ready. I was ready. <laughs> <laughs> See, we can laugh about it now. We can laugh about it now. Hey, hey, you know what uh, that, that uh, yeah. me? Hey. 
Hey, what is it? You did the locker room. That's me and those. You did the locker room. I was not down. I'm not down. What are you talking about? <laughs> hey, Jeff, I thought you were my friend. <laughs> Jeff, I thought you were my friend. Come on, Jeff. <laughs> Where are you at? Hey, Ronald, you already know. Oh, that part is a, that part is gonna be in your party or career forever. <laughs> you, cause you know what? You and other part. What's his name is uh, Mustafa Muhammad. Remember when he said when he said what he said about um when he said to um uh, who did he say? He said it to um Miss Lewis. He said this girl was the perfect. No, what's his name? He said, oh, it, he said it to him. He said nobody came here to see you fight anyway. When he was supposed to fight Mike, when he supposed to fight Mike, Michael Spinks. Yeah, I remember Mama, that. You remember that? He came in over, and he came in overweight. God, Jeff, you don't remember nothing. You don't, you don't forget nothing, huh? <laughs> no, because they had that. No, because they had that. They they were talking about some things in boxing that happened, and uh-huh. you and him were were a part of it. That's why I remember okay. it so clearly because you two were a part of it. Because he was like, um, Mustafa said. So, no, Bruce Lewis said, this scale right here was perfect. No scale has ever been calibrated more perfect than this scale. And then <laughs> Devin Stop said, nobody came here to see you fight. You can shut up with all I that know. stuff. I, I know. <laughs> That's it. That's it. You remember those? Hey, Jeff, you know, <laughs> back, in, back in our era, yeah. we had a good time. I, one thing about it, I had a good time with the sport of boxing, and I respect I respect what, the, what they're doing now. I just, I just, we just need better, better fighters. Yep. <laughs> Do you have a man of many words there? <laughs> yes, sir. Did I lose it there? All right, well, uh, you know, we're about out of time here. So, Marlon, appreciate it. It was great having you on. We'd love to have you back on any time. Uh, it's great catching up with you and, and hearing that you're doing pretty well. So hopefully the, the training thing really takes off for you. I'm sure some, some young fighters could uh, do worse and get some, some guidance from you. So we really appreciate having you on tonight. Hey, man, I thank you guys. Hey, Jeff, we'll see you in town. All right. Appreciate it, man. All Go right. ahead, Jeff. Okay, you guys. Hey, 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 this is like my customary sign off. You ready? All right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right. Oh, hey, Marlon. So, if, if you missed the show, you wanted to catch tomorrow, and we'll go, just go ahead and text Jeff's page, and we'll have the link up there for you. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it, guys. All right. All right. Take care. Thanks, Bye-bye. Marlon. Yeah. Bye. All right, that was Marlon Sterling. Uh, great show tonight. Uh, certainly interesting. Colt Smith uh, joined us first. Ultimate Fighter 16 winner. Congratulations to him, and thanks for him joining us. And then, of course, uh, you know the the legendary Marlon Sterling. Uh, uh, certainly a, a man of many words, and it was uh, great talking to him. So, uh, Jeff, a great way to start off the year, I think. Uh, anything else you want to add before you go? Anything you got going on that we need to know about? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> you just you ready to go watch some TV now, right? You, you went over past your bedtime on the. <laughs> yeah, we, we sure went over. So, I just <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's time for me to go to sleep right. now. Yeah, yeah. All right, we'll be back next week. Uh, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Check out the sites, ProBoxingInsider.com and Pro. I mean, sorry, Pro. Yeah, ProBoxingInsider and Pro MMA Insider. Check Jeff out on Twitter. Jeff Mayweather one. And check out the uh, the Twitters of the boxing site uh, at, at TV Insider and the MMA site at Pro MMA Insider. And that's going to about do us. Uh, again, thanks to all the guests, and, and we will talk to you again next week with a couple of great guests. That'll do it. We'll take care. Adios. I want you to remember me, but the day don't have no memory.